Church. And there we go. Good morning, Texas Baptist College and Southwestern Seminary family. We are uh, grateful to have a time to do some dedicated prayer this morning. So what I want to ask you to do is some of you are making your way in. Go ahead and find yourself in smaller groups, if you don't mind. Group yourself. If you're off by yourself, make sure you get paired up with someone. Because we're going to have some times of corporate prayer, and then we're going to have some small group prayer. So if you can have at least uh, uh, two of you together in a group, or a little bit more uh, this morning, I'd appreciate that so very much. That'll help us uh, go ahead and get in place now, so that whenever we uh, pray, it won't be so much of a distraction. But uh, right now, uh, as we are meeting in our Raleigh Center, the Board of Trustees uh, Southern Bab- of, uh, that the Southern Baptist Convention has uh, sent to keep us in trust are meeting right now. And so we want to be praying for them. We want to be praying for what's going on here in the classroom. And we want to pray for what's going to happen in the future uh, with uh, the summer. And so I wonder if you would just join me in a, uh, a spirit of prayer. And uh, if you'd assume whatever posture of prayer uh, that is for you as you're in groups, uh, we're going to uh, pray. We're going to have uh, hear the word of God and have responsive reading. We're going to sing. And then we are going to pray today. Uh, Join me in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, I come before you and I thank you because you are almighty God. There is nothing you can't do. God, you are the ruler of all things. Lord, even the breath I just took, the word I just spoke, Lord, I could not have done without your power. And so, Father, I pray for the things that are going on today in the classroom as professors teach, students learn. God, I pray for the things that go on in our uh, board meeting right now as decisions are made for now and for the future. And Lord, I pray in this place right now that, Lord, we might seek your face so that in the classroom, in a board trustee meeting, and Lord, even here in chapel, that, Lord, uh, nothing would overshadow you and that you would be uh, given all the preeminence here and that, Lord, uh, you would hear your people sing, pray, and worship you, and you would be delighted in it. So, Father, this time we commit to you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Well, good morning to you. As we begin this time of prayer together, um, let's read responsibly from First Chronicles chapter 16. This is part of David's prayer of thanksgiving. And I just encourage us as we as we look at these words, sometimes these seem a bit perfunctory for us. Sometimes it seems like this is just the routine that we do. But in prayer, in our worship, God reveals himself and we respond. And that's the beautiful rhythm of this that we get to do together today. So may I invite you to stand for a few moments. And let's look at these words together from 1 Chronicles 16. Uh, I will begin. Brothers and sisters, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell about all his wondrous works. Boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord Rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Seek his face always. So may I encourage you, all of us, may the eyes of our hearts be enlightened. May the meditations of our hearts be on Christ as we turn our eyes.
First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 25 and following. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of all the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. As we continue in worship this morning, we, we have come into this room uh, with hearts heavy, probably, with sins upon us that we have not really confessed and given to the Lord. So I want us to go into a time now of individual prayer and confession for our own sins. We look to the face of Jesus, and in his face we find forgiveness, but we are to confess our sins to receive that forgiveness. So in, in this time now, let us just bow our heads privately and ask the Lord for 
forgiveness. Oh God, we come before you knowing that we are sinners, that we have done wrong even this morning. We have thought thoughts that we should not have thought. We have spoken words to others created in your image that we should not have spoken. We have done deeds that aren't in accordance with your righteousness and glory that we sing about and read about in your word this morning. So, Father, in in this moment, we confess we are sinners. Father, as we confess these sins to you, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We know that we, we sin as your people as well, as, as churches, as institutions that are called to do work for your glory and for your kingdom. And we ask you to forgive us where we failed in those ways. But we come together, Father, with the assurance that we have from your word in Romans 8 that says, therefore, there is no, there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And we praise you, Father, for the assurance and the confidence that we have in the finished and completed work of Jesus Christ. And we continue to worship you now in that assurance. As we sing this, as mercy is more, we'll sing it as a prayer. And it will remind us of these words. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sin. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many. His mercy sing this together what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea sins they are many his mercy is more we sing what patience could wait what patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood beneath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy
focus a time of specific prayer, hear these words from 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that what we have what we have asked of him. So in continued preparation and just positions of our hearts and our attitudes, I may invite you to stand and let's sing together this beloved old hymn, The Sweet Hour of Good morning, Texas Baptist College and Southwestern Seminary family. It is an honor and a privilege for me today to be able to come and to open up the Word of God and really kick off this series that we have in the book of Philippians. 
And I just want to encourage you as students to make sure that you are coming to each and every one of these uh, um, sermons uh, on the book of Philippians, that your own professors are going to be preaching. You're going to uh, learn what the Bible means in its context. And as we'll see a little bit later on in our text, sometimes there's been scriptures that have been used in this very book, the book of Philippians, to mean something or ascribe meaning that actually was not uh, meant for, uh, by the Apostle Paul. And so it's going to be a really great series for us to really get into the mind of Paul with a church that helped support him, his companions, and the advance of the gospel in the first century. You know, I don't know about you, but I love a good story. <laughs> I love movies. And as I do, I, I, I was thinking and preparing for this sermon about some of those one-liners that you get in a story or that you get in a, in a movie for, uh, for whatever it's worth. For example, maybe you've heard this one. Once upon a time. That's right. Once upon a time. Or maybe you've heard uh, this one. Uh, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Or maybe my, one of my favorites, though the Bible is my favorite, uh, but one of my favorite secular movies is A Long Time Ago in a Galaxy Far, Far Away. That's right. You know, some of the great stories of the Bible, some of the great stories in, sec in the secular world have this one-liner that they're known for, this one-liner that really everybody remembers and really frames the understanding of what's going on in the story or in the movie. This morning, I want to speak to you on the first two verses of Philippians chapter 1, the, the greeting, the introduction. And I want you to see that these first few phrases, they really set the stage for everything that we're going to see in the other uh, following three chapters, uh, actually chap four chapters total of the book of Philippians. And I want to speak to you this morning on a, a, a message I've entitled, uh, More Than a Simple Hello, More Than a Simple Hello. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from our Lord, from, excuse me, from our God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word for us today. The, these small little phrases here at the introduction and in the greeting of the book of Philippians uh, are really uh, uh, more than just a simple hello to the Philippians. They are for those of us that are the readers in the 21st century, almost uh, a way in which to see where Paul is going to be going in this letter uh, for itself. And by the way, these uh, two verses, though small in nature, though impactful when we think about the book of Philippians as a whole, these two verses are not just the only ones that really set the stage for the theme of what Paul had in mind as he writes to the Philippians. You've probably heard many of the different, and maybe even memorized many of the different verses that you will find in the scriptures. For example, it's in this book that Paul says that he who began a good work in you will complete into the day of Jesus Christ. You know, you also are realizing that this is the book that says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is the same book where Paul writes in uh, chapter 4, verse 6. He says, do not be anxious, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make your requests known to God and the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And you also will never forget that uh, one-liner that we see in the book of Philippians when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then the last one that you probably heard is that my God will supply all your need in Christ Jesus. This is a book replete with one-liners and with summary statements that really give us an understanding of what Paul wanted to say to the Philippians. And so as we look at this book, we need to kind of 
have some background information so that you will kind of be able to bring this text into view as you listen to your professors this semester preach on this book. Philippi was founded by Philip II of Macedon, and Philip II, he was the father of Alexander the Great, uh, the great conqueror uh, in Greece. This city was founded for him, and Paul had already had an established relationship with Philippi that Luke actually records in, in Acts chapter 16. You'll remember that Luke and, and, and Silas and Timothy, they've joined Paul, and they're looking for where the Lord wants them to go. And they attempt to go one place, but the Holy Spirit forbids them. They try to go another, and they can't get there. And then all of a sudden, there is a vision, and there is a man from Macedonia that appears to, to Paul in a vision and says, come over here. This is what is called and what is referred to as the Macedonian call. And whenever he tells him to come over here, he tells him to come to the port city and to come to Macedonia and to come to Philippi. And then Paul and his companions, Silas and Timothy and Luke himself, they make their way and they are there and they stay in the city for a few days, the Bible says. But on the Sabbath, they make their way down to the river. And there they find some God-fearers. And uh, the one God-fearer that's named there at the river that has some prominence is a lady by the name of Lydia, a seller of purple. And there uh, they've gathered to pray. And the gospel is proclaimed by Paul and his companions. And the Bible says that the very first converts in Europe come to faith in Christ in Philippi. Because not only does Lydia respond to the, Lord, uh, to the Lord preparing and putting belief into her heart, not only does she respond to Christ, but also the members of her household do too. And because they're near some water, they're down at the river, it makes it a real easy thing for them to be able to be baptized and, and begin their walk with Jesus Christ. You know, on this high that uh, uh, Paul and his companions find themselves on, you know, many of the other places that they'd gone beforehand had either expelled them or stoned them or, or, or mocked them or told them never to come back again. They finally find some measure of success right towards the beginning of their journey, and it looks like Philippi is going to be a place where the gospel is just going to thrive without any kind of difficulty. But as you know the story... Luke tells us that in Acts 16, as Paul begins to make his way through the city, that there is a slave girl, a, a young lady who is possessed by a demon, who those demons have given her the ability to be able to foretell the future. She is a slave girl, and there are these uh, men who, who uh, have, have put her into slavery that are making money off of her. And the, the, the problem here is replete, as you know. There's, uh, they are human trafficking, and they are, are keeping this young lady as a slave, and they're, they're not respecting her. But as bad as all those things are, there is a demon or there is demonic forces that are oppressing this young lady. And she is going around, and these demons are speaking through the young lady, and she's almost skipping around behind them, antagonizing them. Uh, getting on their nerves and saying uh, things about Paul and his companions. And Paul finally is, has had enough and he shrugs it off and he turns around and he looks at the slave girl and he speaks to those demons and they, he tells those demons to come out of her and in that moment they do. It should be another time of celebration. The gospel advances in Philippi. But you know as well as I do how the story goes. Those who owned her these evil men, they realized that their prophet was gone because now she didn't have the power to do what the demons had given her power to do beforehand. And so they find Paul and his gospel message as an enemy and they have Paul and Silas drug into a prison and there they are behind bars, chained together with a bunch of criminals and before there ever was a, a jailhouse rock by Elvis Presley, Silas and, and Paul were in the prison and they were singing praises to God and they were praying and God honored this act of worship that these two servants of his had and the jailhouse rocked. Elvis Presley wasn't even there. 
And when it rocked, the doors came open, the chains flew off. And not just of God's servants, but of all the prisoners. And the jailer, uh, seeing that there had been a great earthquake, he came in to see what had happened. And he saw the damage that the earthquake had done and realized that there was nothing stopping these prisoners from escaping. And he was getting ready to take his life. But God cares for people that are even his enemy, for people that don't even know who he is. We know he loves the world because he sent Jesus, but for this jailer, God sent Paul and Silas, and Paul said, don't hurt yourself. We're here, me and my companion here, but we're all here. All the prisoners are here. There's no need for you to harm yourself. And then this Philippian jailer asked one of the most important questions anybody could ever ask. What must I do to be saved? And in response, Paul doesn't stumble. Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But then Paul goes even beyond the question for himself. The man's not even asking for his family. And Paul says, and also for your household. The gospel as it advances, it doesn't just advance to one or two or three, but it advances for all who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says that that's what the Philippian jailer and his household did. And just like Lydia before, they accepted Christ, they were baptized, and then they ministered to Paul and tried to heal him of his wounds before he left and went to the next location. This is Paul's introduction to the Philippian church and to the Philippians themselves. He kept up with them. And and as we see in the book of Acts, Timothy was a a main source of how Paul was able to keep up with the Philippian church. That, of course, included Lydia, her household, and at least the jailer's household, and many others that we uh, see that and assume that uh, had come to Christ through time. And so Timothy is this, is this go-between, is this mediator between Paul and the Philippian church because Paul is having to go on his missionary journeys, but yet this church has been so good to him. And so, for example, we see in Acts chapter 18, verse 5, that when Paul is in Corinth, and he's there and he's getting a lot of opposition from the Corinthians and the Jews that are in Corinth, the Bible says in Acts 15, 5, that Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia. That's all it says. But what we realize is when they come, they came with a gift for Paul so that Paul can now put away the tools of tent making and start taking up the tools of disciple making. And so Paul and Timothy uh, uh, come together and they're able to reconnect on what's going on in Philippi. And then there's another time whenever uh, Paul sings Timothy to uh, Philippi. We see this in Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 23, when uh, he, he sends Timothy back to the Philippians to find out how they're doing. And even in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and And then in verse 23, Paul says, I'm sending Timothy to you, and I myself want to come to you. Although we know about Paul's persecution in the prison, we also know from Paul's own pen that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that when he was at Philippi, he suffered greatly. And so this is a place where God did advance the gospel It is a place that God directed the people to uh, uh, hear the good news through Paul. And people got saved and baptized. Disciples were made. A church was established. But it wasn't without its difficulties. And so as we look at this, um, some people ask the question, from where did Paul write this letter Well, we know he's in prison. In fact, he uh, says, as you'll learn in a couple of uh, uh, times from now, when one of our preachers will come, uh, we we, we learn very clearly that Paul says, there are some who preach Christ out of their own selfish gain. And then there's some that preach Christ in chains. He was speaking of himself. And he says, so whether it's they that are doing it for their gain or whether it's someone like me who's doing it in chains, he rejoices that the gospel Advances, So we know wherever it is that Paul is writing this, we know that he's probably in prison. But we don't know where he is. There are about three major uh, uh, um, places that have been proposed from where he wrote this. 
Um, one of the uh, areas uh, that uh, some people think he wrote this was, was from Rome. Uh, as we know, uh, Macedonia and specifically Philippi was very Roman friendly. There, there, were, there was a population of Jews there, but it was very Roman friendly. And you'll even see at the end of this letter when we get there that uh, he's, uh, Paul says that the, those uh, that are the members of Caesar's household greet you. And so there's some who think that perhaps Paul wrote this in Rome. Uh, there are others that say, well, no, it wasn't Rome. That would have been too far for him to be able to come back, as he mentions in chapter 2. It probably was Ephesus where he is when he's writing this. But there's uh, some disagreement there. And then there's also uh, some thought that it might be Caesarea whenever Paul is there and he's under house arrest under Felix. And, of course, he has a little bit of freedom, but he's there for about two years uh, some people think that. So those are some of the possible places from which he wrote this letter. But what we do know, whether you take the Roman view or whether you take the Ephesian view or whether you take the Caesarean view, we know that Paul was likely writing in prison. So did Paul write this? You know, uh, in your classes, you'll learn about whether or not uh, uh, we know who wrote what. Uh, you know, there's some books, for example, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've assigned that these, uh, these individuals, that these apostles and disciples wrote this book. But it never says, I, Matthew, write, or I, Mark, write. Here, actually, in the text I just read, we do see that Paul claims authorship of this. He and Timothy together. And uh, there's virtually hardly anyone who would ever say that Paul did not write this. There's so much in this that would commend the fact that he did write it. He gives his own biography in chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. He also mentions a number of associates that they knew personally. And uh, that we see also backed up uh, some of these even in the uh, book of Acts, chapter 16, that I've already mentioned. And so we see these associates in, in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, and then chapter 4, verse 18. And so he knows some of these folks. He also uh, is making a personal thanks for a particular gift that was given. And we also have some understanding about this gift uh, that was given to help Paul in his time of need. But probably the, one of the greatest uh, ways that we know, other than Paul himself saying he wrote this, is the very style and the vocabulary that he used. Uh, he uses a greeting. He then, after the greeting, gives a thanksgiving and prayer. He has a benediction. This, this um, uh, with a couple of just minor exceptions, this form of this book takes very much the form of any other book that we see that we ascribe to the Apostle Paul. So, yes, uh, we do believe that Paul also wrote this. In fact, Polycarp of Smyrna, in his own letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, he said, Paul wrote you. Uh, and so even Polycarp, one of the early church fathers, believed that Paul wrote this book. What are the purposes of the book? As we come together and as this is really an introduction to the whole series as a whole, what are some of the purposes for which Paul writes to the Philippians? Well, number one, I believe when we see it right after the greeting, he wanted to express to the church his deep affection, concern, love, and encouragement for them to rejoice. He really cared for them and they cared for him. And so first of all, he's expressing this deep-seated love and affection for the people. He also wanted to, to write to give them an update, to, to update them on what was going on with him, to update them what was going on with Timothy, and to specifically update them on what was going on with a fellow, fellow companion that they know, a guy that's mentioned in chapter 2, Epaphroditus. And so he is wanting not only to share his love and concern, but he's also wanting to answer some of their concern about how Paul and some of the companions are doing. That's the second purpose of this uh, letter. A third purpose of this letter, as we'll see when you, we get to chapter 3, is he also wants to warn the Philippians. You know, it's very common in many of the churches that uh, were founded by Paul and even in some of the other apostles that there would be those that would come, false teachers and heretics who would come in to try to disrupt the advance of the gospel in that congregation. And Paul just hits it head on and he actually says who these people are. He calls them in chapter 3, verse 2, he calls them dogs. He says, look out for the dogs. He says, look out for evildoers. 
Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. There, was, uh, there were some that were bringing opposition, and he wanted to warn them of those that were trying to cause problems. Uh, fourth, he also wanted to correct division, and he also wanted to promote unity. Uh, we're going to see that in just a moment. In, it very, in the very first thing that he writes to the Philippians, he wants to promote unity. He wants there to be no division. He wants there to be an ultimate view of humility. You know how it is in any, uh, when you get a group of any kind of uh, Christians together, and especially Baptists. When you get two Baptists to, uh, uh, together, you probably have about three or four opinions in the midst. And when you have that many opinions in the midst of two Baptists, there's going to be some disagreement. There's going to be some people who think they're right and the other person's wrong. And there's just a, a recipe for a lot of disagreement. And Paul is going to prescribe specifically in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, that the answer to division and the source of unity in a church is humility. And so he's writing for this purpose as well. And then last, he is wanting to express thanks for what the Philippian church had done in sending a gift to him. And so these are some of the purposes that you'll see as we go through this entire series this semester to see why it was that Paul wrote the book of Philippians. Now, having said all of that and, and kind of uh, giving a, a foretaste of what this book is going to look like, I want to focus on some of the things that we see in these two verses in this greeting. Again, Paul writes, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, that sounds pretty Pauline. Paul, uh, in fact, you're going to see in the next book of the Bible, Colossians, Paul introduces himself and he introduces Timothy. This, nothing seems amiss, nothing seems out of sorts. But this is very interesting because this is very unique to Paul. Paul, whenever he's writing and he introduces himself and someone else, he usually has a degree of separation. For example, if you were to look and just flip your page maybe to Colossians chapter 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. You see how there's kind of a degree of separation? And this is pretty standard for Paul whenever he is writing or co-sending a letter. He'll usually identify himself many times as an apostle. And then he'll say, and so-and-so. And one of the, 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 the titles that he likes to use is our brother or something like that. This is the only time that we see Paul putting Paul, uh, Paul himself and a companion together and actually using a title in the plural for both of them. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants. Douloi, doulos. Uh, this is, these are slaves. And so what he's doing is he's introducing from the very get-go one of the main purposes that he has for the letter Instead of coming like he does many times and saying, Paul, an apostle, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants, slaves, slaves of Christ Jesus. You see, in our local churches, whenever we find that there is some sense of disunity and some sense of disharmony and, and there is a need for there to be unity of the spirit, the answer to that is not to push your weight around but it's to push your weight down, <laughs> to be humble and to be before someone and put their needs before your other and to be a slave and servant to others. Humble yourself. And so that's exactly what Paul does here. Instead of uh, separating him and Timothy, he puts them together. Now, uh, just so you know, just in case you get confused, when he says Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, he's not saying that both of them are co-authors to this epistle. They are both co-senders. In fact, if you read any commentary, you will see that many times they count the number of times that Paul uses the first person. In fact, Paul uses the word I 52 times just in the book of Philippians alone. Timothy's not a co-author. He's a co-sender, but they are there together, and Paul starts with he and Timothy the way he wants them as a church to operate with humility, taking on the role of a servant. And of course, as you know, and uh, as I've already kind of made mention to, he's going to, in the next chapter, he's going to talk and come back to that word doulos, and he's going to talk about how Jesus 
became a slave, a servant. Though he was in the form of God, he did not kill himself. He did not kill himself to hold on and grasp on to his deity and to push his weight around. He became and he came to us in the form of a servant. And so what we see here is in this introduction, it is in some ways almost a table of contents and a foreteller of what Paul is going to say. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. That's who is writing or who is sending this, but he also is going to address to whom he is writing. And here's what he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Again, he and Timothy are servants in Christ Jesus, but the saints, all the saints, not just a particular group, they are combined, they are to be unified. All of the saints are also in that same phrase, in Christ Jesus. And then he comes to the other thing that is very unique about Philippians, unlike any other epistle that he writes. Not only does he uh, attach himself and Timothy and call themselves by the same way instead of separating and calling himself an apostle and Timothy a brother. But the second thing he does is he adds a phrase that is nowhere else in any other greeting that he writes. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, and then he adds, with, literally it's with overseers and deacons. Now, the ESV that I'm reading from has the, the definite article with the overseers and deacons. But in the, in the original text, there is no definite article. Why in the world is he talking about the overseers and the deacons as well? Well, there are a lot of different uh, views and a lot of different ideas of why he includes this and it's not included anywhere else in any of the writings of Paul that we have. You know, uh, you could go extreme in some way and be like Donald Riddle or uh, Harold Hutzer, uh, Hudson, excuse me, who said that uh, this phrase with overseers and deacons, that that was actually a later edition. But friends, I don't think it was a later edition at all. I think it very much meets the expectations and the motivations of why Paul is writing this. Some have said, well, maybe he's included overseers and deacons because in chapter 4, he's going to talk about some of those that are leading, some of those that have served with Paul. In fact, of note, uh, Eudodia and Syntyche. He's also going to mention Clement. He's going to ask for uh, a, a, a fellow companion, a true companion to help these women. And there are some who think that he is saying this about the deacons is because perhaps these two ladies that are fussing with each other, they're leaders in the church, and he's calling them out because maybe they're deaconesses or something like that. That's a view that's out there. I think the most likely reason, though, that Paul is talking about the overseers and the deacons is for this reason. He, he and uh, Timothy are leading. They are leaders in the church movement, the plant, church planting movement, and they are servants, and they are unified. Again, only time that Paul brings himself together with someone else and there not be a degree of separation. He is bringing unity. And because there is some measure of disunity in the church, I think what Paul is saying is this. He's saying to all the saints with the overseers and deacons. In other words, you all don't need to be uh, lording yourselves over because you have a certain title over somebody else. You may be overseers, you may be deacons, but just like Timothy and, I, uh, T Timothy and myself, you are slaves of Christ. I think really what Paul is doing here is, because he doesn't use the definite article, if I think he was really wanting to point out particular people, I think what he would say is, with all the overseers and the deacons. But actually what he says is, with overseers and deacons, it's more general He's trying to bring together the whole, saint, the whole body of saints there in Philippi. And what he's doing, I think, is to say this. Whether you're an overseer, whether you're a deacon, or whether you are a lay person, that all of these folks make up a unified body known as the church or the saints that are at Philippi. And so it's a reminder to us in our own churches that if you are called to serve in some way, if, if you're called to be a, a deacon in your church, a, a servant, if, if you're called to be an overseer or a pastor or an elder, friends, it's not about you. We are servants to Christ. And by the way, uh, without 
a church body without all the saints. Uh, if there's not saints there to, to lead and there's not saints there to serve, then there's not a church there at all. And so I think what he's trying to do here is he's, instead of pointing specific people out, I think he's really trying to bring people together. And then he gives them a blessing and he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. He's going to talk about grace. In fact, he begins this letter with grace to them. And if you look at chapter 4, at the very end, the very last verse, he says, God's grace uh, be extended unto you. He starts as he ends, and he ends as he starts. And it's all about God's amazing grace. But he also includes here at the beginning, he includes peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the last chapter, it may not be at the end like grace is, but in the last chapter, we've already mentioned how he talks about God's peace. He says, for those of you that find anxiety and worry to be anxious for nothing but in all things by prayer and supplication to make your requests known to God and the what? Peace. That's right. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts that is, the seat of your emotions and your minds, the seat of your intellect in Christ Jesus. So uh, this is a greeting. This is a hello to the Philippian church. But what I want you to see is this. This is not just a greeting. It is that, but it's more than a simple hello. What we see in this text, in these two verses of Scripture, Paul is going to set the stage for what he's going to do in the entire book. First of all, I want you to see that the one word that is repeated more than anything else in these two verses is the word Jesus. He says, Christ Jesus, we're slaves in Christ Jesus, uh, Paul and Timothy. He says, the saints who are in Christ Jesus. And then he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord. And he switches the order of Christ and Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And other than the way he uses Christ throughout the book, the one phrase that he uses more than the other, if, you're, if he uses either Christ Jesus or, or Jesus Christ, he's going to use Christ Jesus. In other words, he's going to use it more in these first two verses, and you're going to see that played out into the rest of the book. It's a favorite phrase of his, in Christ Jesus. It's a major theme. Christology and the understanding of who Jesus Christ is is a major part of this title. And the second thing I want you to see is servants. Paul is calling the Philippian church just as he calls us today to be servants. You know, social media has not helped us in terms of selfishness and in terms of pride and in terms of getting our name out there. And it's a battle each and every day. And no, it's not just in that. It's even in a church. Maybe you're trying to lead and, and you've got all the right intentions, but you're trying to, to garner some kind of leadership because you think that you know what is best and maybe it is what is best. But a lot of times in our culture, we find that there is a lot of pressure placed on those who try to lead. And Paul's good reminder is, even though he's called to be an apostle and says so in many other, other places, he sees himself and his companion Timothy and his other companions for that matter as slaves to Christ Jesus. Do you see yourself as a slave? Do, do you go in and do you lead your church in such a way where it's your way or the highway? Or do you lead your church in such a way where you say it's his way, not my way or the highway, it's his way? And then last, I want you to see this, grace and peace Paul begins where he ends. God's grace. What is God's grace? Well, in understanding God's grace, you need to understand a few other words. God's judgment is getting what you deserve. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. But grace, God's amazing grace, God's grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. And if you're here today, I want you to know that God has extended his grace to all of us. 
And the proof of that is that he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is the very expression of grace itself. He has sent Christ Jesus into the world, as we see in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And he came, he took on flesh, and he died to the point of death for our sins. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee and every tongue on earth, above earth and below earth may confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you want to receive God's grace, you've got to confess Christ as Lord. If there's never been a time in which you can do that, let me just tell you, you can do that today. You need to realize that you're a sinner, that you cannot please God because you're, the evil works that you do do not please God. And even the good things you do don't please God either. If your good things that, that, that you do could please God, Jesus would have never had to die on the cross. You're good, you're bad, everything is a full package, does not please God. But there is one who pleases God. It's his beloved son, Christ Jesus. Jesus came and he lived a sinless life. He died on Calvary's cross, taking in his body on the tree the wrath that was reserved for us because of our sin. And he died paying the penalty for sin. He was buried. On the third day, he was raised from the dead. And so if you'll change your way of thinking that you can't please God, only Jesus can please God and put your faith in him, you can be a recipient of God's grace, something that you and I do not deserve, but God gives us freely. And you know what the benefit of having God's grace is? You get his peace. Yes, friend, uh, whenever we go through life, there are going to be some anxious days. There are going to be some times that we have some worry. There are going to be some times that, that we just don't know what to do, and, and we think we went on a panic, and we want to spend all of our time just worrying. But Paul says to us, don't you worry about anything. Pray about everything. And when you do that, God's peace will help your emotions and your heart. It'll help your intellect and your mind. And God's peace will reign over you. I pray that as we go through this series this semester, that God would remind us of his grace and peace. That God would remind us that we are servants of Christ Jesus. And that God would remind us that we are his people that are supposed to work together and not apart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, and I thank you for this good word. I thank you for how Paul has laid out for us in the very two verses of this text a direction that he's going to take for the Philippian church. And Lord, we all recognize here today that this was not just written for the Philippian church, though it was primarily written for them. It's also written for us today, too. And so, Father, I pray that we would make our lives about you, Jesus Christ. This letter is all about you. May we make our lives about you. Lord, I pray that we would assume the right position in our roles in the church and we would be servants of Christ Jesus. And last, Lord, when troubles come, when anxiety rises, when worry comes to the fore, Lord, please let your peace govern our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen.